Mark your calendars December 11th at the Royal Highland Center in Edinburgh, Scotland, because you'll want to be at the UK Offshore Wind Supply Chain Spotlight 2025. This isn't just another conference. It's where the UK's offshore wind supply chain comes together. Co-hosted by ORE Catapult and the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership, Spotlight 2025 is where developers connect with suppliers and where the next breakthrough in offshore wind technology gets its moment to shine. So whether you're looking to forge new partnerships, secure critical investments, or simply stay ahead of the curve in this rapidly changing sector, you need to register for this event. So register now for Spotlight 2025 in Edinburgh. Just Google Edinburgh Supply Chain Spotlight 2025 or click the link in the show notes below. You're listening to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast, brought to you by BuildTurbines.com. Learn, train, and be a part of the clean energy revolution. Visit BuildTurbines.com today. Now here's your hosts, Alan Hall, Joel Saxon, Phil Totaro, and Rosemary Barnes. Well, greetings from Charlotte, North Carolina, to the Queen City. I'm Alan Hall, and I'm here with Phil Totaro from the Golden State of California, and Joel Saxon is at an undisclosed location in a secure bunker, so that's not going to leak out where he is. And Rosemary is enjoying the winter months in beautiful Australia, and we have some interesting topics this week. But I want to lead off with Rosemary went to another WIND conference, WIND Plus conference in Australia. Rosemary? Yeah, actually, I, I feel petty um, dissing this conference now because this is the one that Alan, you and I did a whole episode on how bad this conference was last year. And um, that's what caused us to feel like we needed to organize our own wind energy conference uh, that covered some technical topics. But yeah, walking around the conference, I'm like, why is there so much hydrogen stuff at a wind energy conference? And I'm like, okay, well, maybe that's like what they perceive that, you know, most of the new projects in Australia, all the big ones say that they're associated with hydrogen so maybe that's it and then i started seeing a lot of um carbon capture things and you know like e-fuels and uh, all sorts of all sorts of things related to co2 um so that confused me um and then i saw that it was also a carbon capture conference too so yeah the exhibition was was not not too bad i had definitely had lots of good conversations with people um some interesting things like um the drone uh, yeah, drone inspections, a few new capabilities coming up. There were a couple of people with good drones um, that can uh, test the resistance of an LPS and say that they can do a whole turbine in an hour and a half. So um, that's that, that's pretty good. There was also some cool NDT, uh, non-destructive testing stuff, and a really small portable ultrasound machine. And they wouldn't give me a price, but it seemed like maybe um, a wind farm could own one and use it to sometimes check repairs. I know I've heard some operators in Australia have been saying how um, they are a bit confused about whether their repairs are good or not because they do see the same blades coming in for repair over and over again. And I haven't actually um, seen seen the data to know, is this the exact same location or is it somewhere else? But, you know, if you're having a problem like that, then investing in a small ultrasound machine and the expertise to use it because it's definitely not something where just any random off the street can <laughs> can interpret the results. But this particular machine, and I haven't looked into it, I just had the chat at the booth yesterday. They say that it can work on quite curved surfaces, which um, usually it, it will struggle. So if that's true, then that could be quite handy. But yeah, um, I didn't go to any of the presentations because I was so... I don't, I'm going to say disgusted. I was actually disgusted by it last year. Not just like disappointed or not interested. It was like a stronger emotion than that because it's just like, you know, they get all these people here kind of promise that you're going to learn something about, about wind energy, but instead they just put people on stage who are either one, they work for a company who has sponsored the event. If you sponsor the event, then it comes with a certain number of speaker slots attached to it. Um, or two, that they, you just explicitly pay for the presentation. And I can't remember, but I think it's around about 10000 US dollars. So this year I saw just a few of the, there's some smaller stages in the exhibition area. Um, I saw some like weird ones on hydrogen where they're still talking like it's, I don't know, 2018 and no one's really sure what hydrogen can or can't do. What else? Oh yeah, and then other thing, um, I did pass this hilarious little scene where they had a backdrop that said women in net zero future, um, like written on the background, not like projected on there, written there. And then um, you know, panel after panel was uh yeah, full of full of men 
Um, this particular photo I took is extra funny because it just looks like five versions of the exact same guy. It's, it's like, you know, say, same age, same haircut, same race. It's just like, is this just, yeah. So that is a handy tip for organizers that if you're going to, you know, write women on your background, maybe think about how many women that you have speaking. Worth going. Um, and uh, again, it, you know, reignites my uh, passion for putting together an event where you actually, you know, talk about the technical issues and, um, you know, present information that people can learn from. Um, yeah, you know, um, companies with products can learn about what the problems that operators are facing and operators can learn about solutions that exist. So that's, um, yeah, we're, we're working at the moment on that for the next conference. I think that's uh, also the goal of what's... Um, We've got Wind Summit coming up in Houston in a few months. So there are good events out there. Are you worried about unexpected blade root failures and the high cost of repairs? Meet EcoPitch by Onyx Insight, the standard in blade root monitoring. Onyx's state-of-the-art sensor tracks blade root movement in real time, delivering continuous data to keep your wind farm running smoothly and efficiently. With EcoPitch, you can catch problems early, saving hundreds of thousands of dollars. Field tested on over 3,000 blades, it's proven reliability at your fingertips. Choose EcoPitch for peace of mind. Contact Onyx Insight today to schedule your demo of EcoPitch and experience the future of blade monitoring. Uh, the White House has issued a new order requiring Interior Secretary Doug Burgum to personally approve all wind and solar energy projects on federal lands and waters. And uh, this enhanced oversight covers everything from leases to right-of-ways to construction plans and operational approvals across literally millions of acres of federal property. And the Interior Department is saying that it aims to end preferential treatment for what it calls unreliable, subsidy-dependent wind and solar energy. And my first thought of this is like, all right, fine, do it. Let's see how long this lasts, because I don't think the administration can produce the amount of energy that it needs to produce in the short amount of time they're going to be around without wind and solar. They're going to have to let some of these projects through, or there's going to be big-time power constraints, right, Phil? The bigger issue is offshore, as as pertains the Department of the Interior for onshore wind. I mean, certainly solar, but for onshore wind, we only have out of the 55 gigawatts or so that's either um, already been approved for construction and has started construction, uh, is in the interconnection queue, or hasn't been fully approved and permitted yet. Um, I think it's like less than six gigawatts that's even on or touching any kind of federal land or requiring any kind of federal permit, which would fall under this jurisdiction. So, and most, like I said, most of the stuff's already been approved. So there's not much that it's going to impact onshore wind. Solar will be more modestly impacted um, just because if, for utility scale projects, they sometimes use federal land. Um, but for the most part, we we don't really get out there and, and touch that. Where this has, obviously, the, the biggest implication is what we've already seen since January, which is offshore wind. Um, but that's not really a big change. Although what's interesting to me is we'll see, you know, with this whole push for accountability, um, you know, we'll see if they're willing to stand behind their, uh, you know, approvals and assessments the same way they're challenging ones issued by previous administrations. I mean, because at the end of the day, there's not, there isn't much for wind on federal land anyways. I'm speaking just for wind, right, on, on, on onshore. And not much for solar either. Now, we know that there's some good wind resource and some good solar resource on federal lands, but they just haven't been tapped yet. It's mostly all on private land. And I think part of that reason is as well. Federal lands at a large scale in the United States are also where there's no population. Yeah, and no transmission. So what what are we worried about? What's the point? Yeah, there's no... The one place where there was a wind farm that got shut down by the current administration was in Idaho, right? So the Lava Ridge wind farm, which would have been in southern Idaho, got shut down in early January. And this has led to some interesting developments because the administration wants to put nuclear on the same site. So Sawtooth Energy and Development plans to build 
462 megawatt nuclear power plants total. So it would be actually 677 megawatt new scale plants is what they're talking about. New scale is a South Korean company. Uh, and it would be, I guess they call those small modular reactors, 77 megawatts. Uh, and the goal is here is where there would have been a wind farm is to put in these nuclear reactors. Now, they also are claiming that they're going to shorten the timeline down from like five years to two because they're going to run out of time, right? So the administration is going to run out of time, so they got to get these projects in fast. But the South Koreans and New Scale are saying, we don't know much about this. We haven't committed to this project at all. I'm just curious how this is going to work out. If, if I'm a neighbor to uh, these wind farms, and there are wind farms around this area, right, Joel, in southern Idaho, there are quite a few. There's a, there's a horseshoe. If you look at like the U.S. wind turbine database, you'll see this kind of horseshoe in the southern part of, and it's around the mountain ranges where the wind flows through the valley. Yeah, that, that would make a lot of sense, right? So instead of having a wind farm there, they now would have six modular reactors in their backyard. And I'm wondering what you think the politics of that would be locally. Would that would be accepted as like, hey, let's do this nuclear reactor. Let's put six of them down instead of these wind farms. I think that's going to play well in Idaho. If you look at what the objections were to the Lava Ridge wind farm that LS Power was proposing, they centered around the fact that it was going to uh, disrupt uh, a lot of the relics there from um, some of the internment camps um, and, you know, some of the, the history preservation that, that, you know, goes on in that area. So the the reality is I can't imagine how they're not going to have the same objections. Plus, are people there who are already kind of in this NIMBY mood really going to be in the mood for having a, a nuclear plant nearby as opposed to something that doesn't radiate? Well, that's, that, that, that's a key point, too. You live in uh, Idaho. You live in that corner of the world, Wyoming, Idaho, northern Utah, eastern Washington, Oregon. You're there because you love the outdoors for the most part, right? Like people, those people love their natural resources. To cool this reactor, you're on the Snake River. The Snake River is one of the, you're on, that's one of the most storied fishing rivers in the, all of the American West. Snake River runs into the Tetons. Like it is absolutely stunning that, that whole river basin is. So... I got to think that if you think you're going to speed this up from five years to two years, that means you're going to circumvent all kinds of permitting and, you know, public uh, feedback issues and stuff like it's that. You're, you're nuts if you think you're going to do that. Didn't Evil Knievel jump Snake River? Wasn't that the river that he hopped over? I thought he did the Grand Canyon. That's Colorado River. He did the Grand Canyon for sure, but I thought he also did the Rio Grande. I don't remember if he did the Stink River. Well, if Evil Knievel could do it, then I, the, evidently the current administration can do something just as bold, right? We'll see. I think there's a lot of work to do there. Unplanned downtime is massively expensive, but what if you could prevent most of these failures? Join us on July 30th at 11 a.m. Eastern for our next Sky Specs webinar, The Financial Case for CMS, Why Waiting Could Cost You. Benary and Josh Goral from SkySpecs will be joined by operators to reveal how condition monitoring is saving millions in avoided failures. On top of everything, remember now, federal incentives are ending and the European Data Protection Act launches this fall. Your maintenance strategy needs to evolve now. Register at the link provided because reactive maintenance is costing you more than you know. French Utility EDF is considering bringing in capital to its North American and Brazilian renewable businesses. Uh, uh, obviously, there's uh, a need for cash flow with EDF, and they're thinking they may sell up to 50% of those businesses. And it comes at a time when EDF has some offshore losses, but they're also seeking some fundraising to clean up some nuclear projects that are happening in France. There's a lot of aging nuclear reactors that need to be upgraded, and EDF would be the one to go do that. So they're trying to raise some cash. That, that opens up the possibility of some new players coming into the Brazilian market and the American market. Who are likely buyers into EDF? Well, they, they've actually got, uh, in North America alone, 
uh, between the U.S. and Canada, about six gigawatts just in wind. Four gigawatts of it is already, you know, co-owned by a number of different funds, including um, Mazdar, the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board, and Enbridge, um, Alliant Energy, uh, PGGM Infrastructure Fund, etc., um, Allianz, uh, BlackRock. So the the point here is that out of what they they currently own outright, um, it's about two gigawatts of wind. Um, they've got, you know, average PPA on, on that, uh, capacity is about $63, uh, a megawatt hour, although some of that's on a merchant market. And it looks like the total net profit to planned end of asset life per megawatt for that two gigawatts worth of capacity is about $1.9 million. So that's really good. That beats the market average. Um, and so the, what they have as far as their existing portfolio is, is I'd say, fairly attractive. They're asking uh, or seeking something like 2 billion euros, which I think is about 2.2 billion US um, at this point. So, you know, uh, I think they'll... They shouldn't be at a loss to find buyers for this because keep in mind as well, most of their project capacity um, is also old enough to be able to still claim production tax credits. Um, so uh, it's going to throw repowering into question for some of these assets that come up between 2027 and 2029, but um, that'll that'll probably get dealt with in the future. Do you think that there's a play here to say like, hey, we own this 50% or X percent with this person, this person, this person. Is there a partial sale to a bunch of people? Like, is there just like kind of piecemeal? Like, oh, we're fifty percent with you. Why don't you take the whole thing and we'll still maintain it for you? Why don't you take the whole one of this one? Why don't you take the? Whole... Would they do that, or are they want to look to sell it in bulk? I think they would probably. I I don't think it necessarily matters, Joel. That's a good question though, um, because they've already got you know projects where they're they've already been diluted um, by other owners coming in, but. Uh, my impression is that they wouldn't necessarily sell a hundred percent of the projects where they have some stake, um, just because of various, you know, reasons they want to maintain ties with, you know, this market, um, particularly in the U S and, you know, where they've got, you know, more than four gigawatts installed here, it's 1.5 up in Canada. And, uh, I think it's about 600 or so megawatts down Brazil, so, you know, they, they want to be able to maintain what they have, um, but they still want to be able to, um, you know, bring in additional um, capital providers or, or co-owners to some of the capacity they haven't already sold. Um, it's also likely that some of the existing owners may opt out and, you know, want to sell off a, a chunk of what they, they own. So there's opportunities for further dilution um, in that sense as well. But, uh, you know, they've, they've got plenty to left to sell to be able to, you know, get the 2 billion euros that they want to get so they can go fund whatever they feel like funding in, in Europe. That's going to do it for this week's Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll see you here, same time, same channel, for the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast next week. Mm -hmm.